ฮะสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับ There were some meetings today. I couldn't make them, but it seems that we're going over the bump, and right. um, we're peaking in the next two weeks. And uh, they're expecting that we should be able to open shuls by the beginning of August. Amazing! So Thank you. It is a, it is a positive. Did you see the cartoon? Hands up who wants the shuls to open. Yes, who wants a minion? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there will be an adjustment after almost four months already of not uh, having shul. For the rabbis of the community. There, uh, to the rabbis, uh, we have a meeting with the Eser Kriches You know, mm -hmm. we're already on Zoom right now, where it seems that we have all these people with us. Yeah, so hold on, just it's fine. Very nice. So yeah, we'll see where it goes, but everybody will have a choice and we'll work it out. But it'd be nice to be back in shul. Guys, has ever just come on to the platform? Just give it a. We're going to just wait another minute, um, just for other people to come in, and then we'll start. So just bear with us. Bobby, now you've disappeared there. Okay. And I'm back. So Mark, maybe if you make minyanim in your hotels, we can like get them busy. What's that? You make a minion in the hotel. <laughs> well, it's nice to have more than 10 people okay, staying I, in our hotel at the moment. Like, That's quite a blessing. Are you, we don't like it at 50. Okay, guys, we're on Facebook. <clears throat> Sorry, what's that, Rabbi? Said we're allowed legally up to fifty people. So for a minion, you're yeah, get you a few more customers. In our conference yeah. center of three hundred people, you can have uh, fifty. So it's nicely social distanced. Good evening, everybody. Guys, I want to start. Let's start. Okay. Yeah. Good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for joining our live webinar. The Alter Rebbe writes in Tanya that each and every one of us has two souls. One is a godly soul that's found primarily in our brain, and the other is an animal soul that's found in the left ventricle of our heart. And these two souls are continuously fighting with one another. Our entire life is a struggle between these two souls, the one that's found in the brain and the other that's found in the heart. To, to discuss this here this evening, on an, on an emotional, intellectual, and spiritual level, and also to hear a businessman's point of view, it's my very great pleasure to welcome Rabbi David Weinberg from the Maria Rochelle in Cape Town and the businessman Mark Waxberger, CEO of the Capital Group. Rabbi Weinberg, over to you. Thank you, Rabbi Masinta, and to Chabadas for organizing. It's a pleasure to be together with you guys on a panel uh, with your son and my former student, Aaron, Rabbi Aaron Masinta there, I see, and of course, my fellow panelist and friend, Mark Waxberger. It's a great question, and especially, I think, such a timely one, which is why I was excited, Rabbi Masinta, when you asked me that question, because this is probably what we're struggling with most these days. We are trying to figure out how to engage and balance the heart and the mind. There's a well-known story of Moshe Dayan, the great hero of Israel, uh, very famous for his eye patch, and he's one day traveling up north in Israel, and like a good Israeli, and especially a war hero, who takes notice of speed signs and limits. He's speeding along on Kvish Achad. He's flying up, to, up north. And a cop stops him. A police officer pulls over, pulls him over, and uh, starts to berate him. Moshe Dayan, what is this? 80, 80 kilometer zone. You're going 140 kilometers. What's with you? Moshe Dayan looks at him, completely not impressed. He says, Tista Kilalai, look at me. He says, you see, I have one eye. Where do you want me to look? At the road or on the speedometer? Life 
really is exactly that question. It's that balance. We're trying to figure out and constantly adjust between what's ahead of us, going forward, putting our foot on the gas, and finding the balance with the correct measure of um, speed, responsibility, ambition, and all the other elements and factors that come into being. And this is how we go through life on a regular basis. And as we go through life on this basis, we end up with a, uh, we end up sort of trying to figure out the right balance. And then all of a sudden, imagine that this road suddenly takes on a whole new dimension. You're flying along, trying to figure out the right balance. And now I want you to add that you're now speeding at 240 kilometers an hour. And the road isn't slowing down and making it easier for you. And suddenly there's a torrential rain pour coming down. And now there's a clutch besides the pedals. You've got to figure out a third pedal. And another two gears are added. And if that's not enough, there's six kids in the back fighting. What do you want to do in that? All you want to do is absolutely, sorry, give me one moment. We are in Zoom here and at home. Chabad in the home, I know this is called. So, um, I'll just turn off this buzzer here. Okay. So the so suddenly you're so overwhelmed in your car. You're so overwhelmed driving down the road. What would you want to do? I just want to pull over. I just want to take a break. I just want to give yourself a moment to gather your, your wits. And what happens? What happens is in life you can't do that. You can't pull over on the side of the road. And I think that with coronavirus coming along, with this challenges of lockdown and a national lockdown, some of the severest in the world, bringing with it all sorts of challenges. This moment has felt exactly like that. Absolutely flying down the road at speeds that we cannot imagine and no ability to pull over, no ability to really pause, no ability to get off and somehow gather our, our wits before we actually go forward. And in my experience, people have this in life when things become too overwhelming, they suddenly discover that as long as they were able to manage, they were finding the balance, they figured out the right speed, which foot and which pedal to put their feet on. But when things get so overwhelming that they can't do that anymore, they just drown. They just simply give up. They stop looking at the speedometer. They put the foot down to the gas and they just hope to keep going without any end. And unfortunately, the results of that are really dangerous and worrying. And I think that in our situation here, we're dealing with exactly that situation. You know, in America, there's about $14 trillion of credit card debt. The average household in America, the average household in America has about $9,000 of credit card debt. Multiply that with an res- amount of 350 million people. It's an incredible amount of debt that people rack up. And what Congress did a few years ago in America is they realized that if they simply educate people about how debt and interest works, they can help people. So now there's a mandated notice on every single credit card statement that tells you how much you owe in credit card debt and your minimum payment. And if you're to add just a fraction to that minimum payment, your 30 year payment goes down to three or four years, just that little bit. But so many people can't think about that little bit because when they're drowning and when they're challenged and when they're completely suffocating and they, they suddenly lose that equilibrium, the simple solutions cannot sit in front of them. And so Congress hoped that by putting it in front of you, suddenly you would make that little bit more than the minimum payment and completely take yourself out of the hold of debt. Has it worked? Time will tell, but it certainly gives us an insight into the psyche of the individual who has simply lost control of that balance. I want to tell you about somebody that had that struggle, that balance was lost, a man by the name of Mike. Um, Mike wrote a letter to his rabbi in 2000, Rabbi Goldman of the Sydenham Highlands North Shul. And this letter was recently published. And it's a beautiful example of this problem and a solution. You see, Mike was one day visited in his story as a tire place, probably somewhere at the top of Louis Bolt over there in Cromerville. He's got a tire fitment place. And one day, some yeshiva students from the Chabad yeshiva walked in and said, any Jews here? Mike said, I'm Jewish. 
They said, hey, you want to put on tefillin? Mike was embarrassed to admit that he didn't even know how to put on tefillin. He had never put on tefillin before. But he went upstairs to his room, to his office with the boys. They helped him put on tefillin. Surprisingly, he was able to recite the Shema. And he put it on. This became a weekly, regular activity for Mike. What he hadn't told the boys is that he was absolutely drowning in debt. And his business was terribly struggling. It was floundering. And he didn't know a way out. And as he put on tefillin, he became so attached to it. He describes that the first time he put on tefillin, it was like he was enwrapped in a cocoon. And he eventually got his own tefillin. He started putting it on every single day. And suddenly, he was able to think about beyond his immediate worries. He was able to look a little bit at a bigger picture. He started to put away a little bit of money into investments. And one day, as the investments did very, very well, he pulled out. He had a clarity. He pulled out. The market tanked. He says he was just lucky and blessed at the right timing. And with the money that he had made and preserved because he had pulled out, he was able to pay off his entire debt to the bank at that time, some half a million rand. In the year 2000, that was actually worth something. This man was able to clear his debt and get himself some peace of mind. And he credits Tefillin. And he writes to Rabbi Goldman because he started coming to shul more regularly because that's what happens when you start doing one mitzvah. Another mitzvah follows. And he thanked him and he acknowledged how the mitzvah of tefillin had brought such clarity and peace of mind. How does it do that? How does the mitzvah of tefillin do that? In 1967, the Lubavitcher Rebbe initiated a campaign of mitzvahs focusing on the mitzvah of tefillin. Quoting teachings from our sages in the Talmud and elsewhere, he encouraged that people should go out into the street exactly as Yossi Pels had done that Yeshiva Bacher 1998 had started doing and walked into the tire place in Cromerville. Go out into the street and encourage another Jew to put on tefillin. This campaign has eventually reached hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Jews. It has become one of the most recognizable Jewish activities of outreach. But in those days, it was completely revolutionary. So revolutionary, that you would have to go back to the 13th century to find a Jew who actually did that. Remarkably, there was such a Jew. Rabbi Moshe of Kusi, one of the great Balei Tosfot in the 13th century, records in his monumental work, Sefer, Sefer Mitzvot Gadol, the Smag. He records how in 1235, he traveled from France where he lived and he went to Andalusia in Spain. And there he traveled from village to village and city to city, talking to Jews who had completely lost their Yiddishkeit. And what did he encourage them with? He shared with them, he writes, he shared with them the following vart. We all know the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Be Hashem you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with your life and with your possessions. Said this great Rabbi Moshe of Kusi, from France, he told them to love God with your heart, is putting on the tefillin on your hand, because that's what it says, the samti, I will put the dvorai, I will put my words on your heart. This is the tefillin, because the tefillin on the hand sits on the bicep, on the median of the heart. To love God with your, with your life, with your soul, is to love God with your tefillin of your head. To be able to have a Yiddish cup, and that Yiddish cup is focused on the unity and awareness of Hashem at every moment. And to love God with your possessions is to put a mezuzah on your door. And this he went around teaching. And he told them that the heart wants what the heart wants and the mind goes where the mind goes. And this split is at the heart of so much strife. The challenge of life, and we can be inundated, but the real challenge of life is this disconnect between mind and heart. And not simply not listening to the mind. When we analyze the mitzvah of tefillin, we learn some very interesting things. You know, you're not supposed to have the tefillin on your head on without the tefillin on your hand. We first put on the hand, as it says in the Torah, bind it on your hand. And then we put it on our head. But when we take it off, we first take off our head tefillin. And then we take off our hand because we should never have the head tefillin on without the tefillin on the hand. And this is because the mind without a heart is a very dangerous thing. The mind without a conscience is also dangerous. It can be a very cold activity, a very cold object. The heart without the mind 
is also a concern. Who knows where it goes? So we bind them each morning, as the Torah tells us, to unite the heart and mind, to understand that the mind can have thoughts. Thoughts are not yours. You are not your thoughts. You might have crazy thoughts, but you don't have to own them. You can let them go if you need to. Your heart, your conscience, your, the check of right and wrong internally can tell you this is thought is not a healthy thought. Let it go. And on the other hand, the heart can want. Oy, can the heart want? And it gets distracted by everything out there. And for that, we are binded and creating a harmony so that the mind can say, this is not a healthy want. This is not a healthy emotion. 1972, my grandfather, Rabbi Joseph Weinberg, a blessed memory, wrote to the Rebbe. He was a global ambassador of the Rebbe. And one of his friends in Brazil had written to him that a child of theirs had, was suffering from schizophrenia. And asked for a blessing. And the Rebbe writes back a letter. It's published in Lakute Sichas, volume 36, page 239. And there the Rebbe writes to him that he should encourage that this young man who is suffering from this terrible illness should start putting on tefillin. Because schizophrenia, is a, is, at, at its very essence, is a disconnect between the heart and the mind. It's the heart feeling things that are not rooted in reality. It doesn't allow the mind to check the feelings of the heart. And therefore it goes through tremendous swings of great fear and panic and paranoia to great elation. It moves up and down. With tefillin, one allows and is given a gift by Hashem to bring a unity between the heart and mind. What a magnificent thing Hashem has given us. What a magnificent gift he's bequeathed us. The opportunity to put on tefillin, the opportunity to create this unity, this merger, this balance between heart and mind. But there's another law in tefillin. And the law in tefillin is that we don't simply put it on our hand by the heart. We wrap our hand with tefillin. And why do we wrap our hand with tefillin? Because ultimately the truest measure of balance of heart and mind is found in action, represented by the hand. When in doubt, act. When unsure, when being held back by fear or thoughts of, of insignificance or somehow insecurity, understand that if you are motivated to act in a positive way, that's the most important thing. And if you don't feel like it, do it anyway, because it's the right thing to do. The, learn, the world of action is the ultimate measure we know, I, I don't want to, I've already spoken enough about business and Mark's going to give us more. He has a little bit more experience in business than I do, thank God. But one of the measures of success, whether it's in business or any other endeavor, is the willingness to act even if you fail. The fear of failure is sometimes the worst thing. The fear of excellence doesn't allow us to do good. Action is an absolutely necessary measure of life. You don't feel like it today act anyways because you know it's right. Somehow your mind is, is playing games with you and thinking all sorts of distracting thoughts. You know what you have to do. The first thing we do in tefillin is not the heart and it's not the head. It's the action. Binding our arm because action is the ultimate test of if we're going in the right direction. In the year, I think it was 2000, Ariel Sharon was voted in as Prime Minister of Israel. It was a 2000 or 2001. It was a very difficult time, which is an understatement. Israel was being attacked from within and without. The Intifada was at its height. Hundreds of attacks every single day. Jews losing their lives every single week. Terrorist attacks. There would be, and Ariel Sharon becomes prime minister. And the newspaper, I think it was the Ma'ariv, interviews him. And they say, Prime Minister Sharon, where are you going to start? Where are you going to start? You have attacks from outside the world. The, everybody's voting against you and, and screaming at you for doing the solutions. You have attacks from within, physical attacks. Where do you begin addressing the problems? And he said, you know, the Lubavitcher Rebbe taught me something. I once went to see him. He had a close relationship with the Rebbe. And, and in one of those visits, he asked the Rebbe a similar question. And the Rebbe said to him, you do and focus on what needs to get done first. You can't solve all of the global problems now. If you think about all of them now, you'll get lost in them. Focus on what needs to get done. Do that first and then move on to the next thing. 
Ariel Sharon, as we know, was very successful in curbing the terrorism in Israel and bringing a measure of quiet and stability there because of exactly this approach. We are engulfed with a wave of a virus that we cannot see, but we feel very, very deeply. We have no idea what tomorrow will bring, maybe not even what today will bring. We are living with an uncertainty that our generation has never known. We have lost the ability to figure out whether we should be applying pressure on the speed, on the, on, on, on the, on the gas, on the brake, on the clutch, looking outside or inside. And so the tefillin says, look at action first. What do you need to do now? Should you wish to indulge in thoughts of the future and figuring it out, you will get lost. Your mind will take you to places you don't need to go. Your heart will feel things you, can't, you don't need to feel. Focus on action. Then bind your mind and your heart together. Bring it into a totality and a unity that work together for a greater purpose, for the purpose and the recognition of Hashem's presence. And in this way, you will find a certain peace of mind that allows you to go forward in the way you need to. We speak about the mitzvah of tefillin, but I think it's just important to finish off and recognize that 50% of our population doesn't wear tefillin. Women are not obligated to wear tefillin. They don't wear tefillin. That's not to say that somehow they can't find peace of mind. A woman generally would have the ability to find a certain harmony of heart and mind of focus in a, in a made perhaps more intuitive manner. Certainly the mezuzah on one's door of a home is a solution that the smog in the 13th century presented as an important part of healthy living uh, for everybody. It's important to remember that when God has given a certain part of the population the solution, it is necessary for that part of the population. But for the, all those who are, do not have that mitzvah, or for the days that nobody puts on film like Shabbos and Yom Tif, we have the tools that Hashem has given us of awareness of His unity, the mitzvah of Shema each morning and evening, the awareness that we have, that our mind and our heart need to come together, that action prevails over all. And may we all find the peace of mind and the strength to get through this difficult time together. Thank you to Rabbi Masinta for the invitation, to Chabadas for putting this together. And you know, we go from the world of the theoretics, the mind, the heart, and now let's move into the hand, to action, to tachlis, to the real deal, to the question of how do we actualize these ideas in real life. For that, I'm very happy to hand over to my friend, businessman Mark Wexberger, to share with us some of his own thoughts on this mitzvah as well. Thanks, Rabbi. Thanks, Rabbi Masinta, firstly, for having me, and Rabbi Weinberg, a very hard act to follow. Um, it's quite interesting because my story will actually end with me telling you that I've been putting on tefillin and I've actually been having all the benefits that you've outlined. Um, but actually, I didn't know why. I did not know why until you have been telling me right now. And so it's hugely enlightening. I'll go back to um, the beginning of a short story of a one-year story, which is that I was lost last year. I have a successful hotel business called The Capital. Uh, thank God it's been going well. Uh, last year in particular going well. But really I was lost as an individual. I've been struggling um, to kind of find myself. And with that, I was meeting with Rabbi Masinta. We've been learning Tanya. And you know, I've been listening to the struggle between heart and mind. It was the first time I had heard of it, learning Tanya from Rabbi Masinta. But quite frankly, I've been struggling. And when I got towards um, uh, January of this year, I went to Harvard Business School on a uh, educational session with YPO. And at the session, there was a moderator of our group of nine people who was the most amazing guy, a non-Jewish guy, who really just was all about everyone else. He couldn't care for himself for one second. He was just caring for everyone else. And I said to him on the first day I met him, I said, this is too good to be true. I'm going to find your flaw by the end of the seven days that we're together. It just doesn't make sense. And uh, we form actually a very confidential group when, when we're in YPO called the Forum. 
So uh, that group continues to meet over the next seven days and we got to know each other very well. And still I couldn't figure out how it's possible. By the way, he's a fourth generation multi-billionaire living in the States, uh, one of the biggest construction firms in the States. He has an absolute fortune of money and um, has a very, very uh, wonderful life, but I still could not understand why he's all about everyone else. And right at the end, he said to me, uh, I sat down one-on-one -on -one with him and I said, so what is the story? How do you actually do it? And he said that he is a religious man, um, uh, not Jewish, but he is all about being in service of God. And that just resonated with me that what I'd lost in the prior year is that I was not acting in the service of God. I think I was on that uh, highway that you speak about, Rabbi Weinberg, you know, not being able to look at the speedometer and the uh, highway at the same time. And uh, when that hit home with me, um, I, I decided I'm going to adapt that. And I sat down with, uh, with Rabbi Masinta and I said to Rabbi Masinta very frankly, I said, Rabbi Masinta, I got to tell you, um, learning Tanya is just not quite resonating with me. Uh, by the way, last year I was wearing to fill in maybe once a month, more out of guilt. I think as a businessman, what I'd always been doing is, you know, businessman is always about hedging. We hedge our strategies, right? And as part of that, you, because clearly I believe in God, right? Uh, I'm not religious, but I believe in God. And as part of the hedging strategy, I don't want to land up at the pearly gates of heaven, not having tried and believed and pushed and prodded and tried to find myself. So as part of that, um, I was almost out of guilt putting on tefillin once a month. Uh, my wife would say, have you, have you laid tefillin? Okay, let me go. I was speeding down the highway, forgetting really about tefillin. So when I sat with Rabbi, Rabbi Masinta this year and said to him, I've just come back from Harvard, I've had this recognition and I just want to be good. That's it. Be good, be kind. Rabbi Masinta knows all about that. That's the slogans that we put out. I said to him, isn't just as simple as that, you know? And he said to me, okay, I'll make you a deal. That's fine, but do one thing for me. Where to fill in? And obviously when Rabbi Masinta tells you to do something and that seemed like a very good deal right there. I took it with both hands and I said, okay, fine, that's it. So, you know, I wasn't going to learn Tanya. I wasn't, I was just going to be good and where to fill in. And I started laying to fill in. This is probably uh, beginning of February. And what I found was that I was just reading the words, but the speedometer was kind of going along. Life was busy in early February. But yes, I was taking action to your point. I was taking the action of wearing to fill in, but I wasn't, it wasn't absolutely, I got to tell you, you know, it wasn't like I just put on to fill in and pow, like amazing, amazing. It just wasn't that for me. But what it was is that uh, I started to link the mind uh, and to the heart really, uh, you know, it did start binding. And I started thinking a bit more about my actions and focusing on being uh, selfless, caring for others, be good, be kind, and together it all merged. Now, when COVID hit, being in the hotel sector, we're really in the eye of the storm. And I got to tell you, just thinking that every morning, laying to fill and reading the words, now that's where it really started for me. But when I started reading the Shema in English, and then reading the Amida in English and focusing on what it was saying, knowing that here comes this virus to destroy my livelihood and the livelihood of the 800 people that work for me. That's really when I started finding real inspiration in the words of the Shema and the Amida and I also do Aleinu. And uh, together they really started to make sense because I felt like I could just trust in God. Uh, Imunai is a very powerful thing. 
And I just felt very comfortable going through the eye of the storm of COVID that actually everything's going to be fine. Actually, I do not need to worry what will be, will be. And, uh, and then before you know it, uh, I was actually quite interested to uh, start reading some Tehillim as well, which uh, Rabbi Masinta has an incredible app called um, uh, Psalm for That, I think it's called. Rabbi Masinta will tell us shortly. But uh, I was just reading one Tefillin, and one of the headlines of this Tefillin app is Turn Challenges into Opportunities. So I have Tefillin on in the morning, uh, start binding the heart and the mind. And then I finish with reading uh, uh, Tehillim. And some of these Tehillim, I tell you, they were just, they were just as if they were giving me a message about what I was going through with COVID literally destroying my hotel business and how actually it would be fine. As long as I had Hashem on my side, I would be fine. Anyway, needless to say, where we're at right now in our business is thanks, thank God, Things have turned around uh, right through COVID. Uh, we were the only hotel group that got an, an approval from the Department of Health to remain open. Um, how that happened, you know, was taking action, no question about it. But in addition to that, I mean, I really think that, uh, that God was on our side there because then being open meant that we were at the forefront of being able to get a lot of um, quarantine business, We've had all repatriation flights come in and support us. And in the end, uh, we have looked after uh, a huge amount of our staff members. Because that's the other thing, you know, to be selfless, it's all about my focus was also just on my people and my staff and making sure that they're okay. And, um, and uh, between this tours payout and between how much they've worked for us because we've been open and active, our staff have actually been really okay. Uh, it's always worrying what's going forward. But again, with this trust in Hashem and uh, the davening that I'm doing every morning, I feel very, very confident that where our business is at the moment, it's actually uh, is going to survive. And really uh, amazing opportunities are now coming our way as well. I would like to... Um, uh, Rabbi Masinta, can I just ask you to say what that what the app is called, and then you sure, um, introduce the video. Okay, hold on a sec. First of all, the app is called Psalm for That. Um, Psalm for That is both in the Google Store. Psalm with a with a number four. But I just want to ask one or two questions here. Number one is as follows: You speak about filling on these black boxes. Is it symbolic? Is there something in it? What's the energy? In it? How does it attune? Does it tune in up on high and bring down a godly radiance, uh, Rabbi Weinberg? That's a question number one. Question number two that's coming over here is that it is as follows. If I'm sinning all over the place, if I'm living a, a bit of a corrupt life, God forbid, can I still put a filling here? Isn't this a bit of a, an oxymoron? Uh, that's question number two. And please answer those two questions. We have one more. And Mark, you want to take the first one or should I? You take the first, probably okay. second, better for me. <laughs> okay, thank you for your for your for your uh, experience there, Mark. That was very beautiful, um, Rabbi Masinta. Just to answer your question, the the first one is how does it work? The the entire Torah is structured as a interface between heaven and earth. It is structured in a way that the spiritual godly energies find the earth, as it were, the vessel within which to operate and to experience in this world. Um, the tefillin, uh, which are leather boxes, essentially animal hide, with a ink um, and leather straps and, and parchment, again, leather hide. Are these, these are physical, very, very material, basic ingredients of life. And they become the tool through which Hashem's um, presence and the, the really the, the light of a certain sort of supreme in, intellect and, and awareness is able to rest in this world. And that's why the tefillin of the head and the tefillin of the hand are constructed differently. Although they both have the same four portions extracted from the Torah, which um, speak of the mitzvah of tefillin. In the head, they are placed into four individual compartments. 
and in the hand they are placed into one compartment because the head is, is, is speaks about the Kabbalah speaks about four division of four um, elements of intelligence and so each one is its own sort of area of extraction of filter of in intellect and understanding and the heart is uh, more of a mishmash of experience and so it goes into one box so each one of these things is designed very very precisely to draw in a, a heavenly awareness and a heavenly condition of, of presence so that ultimately it affects us with a certain depth of awareness as well and you don't have to know about it mark as he said earlier didn't understand why suddenly things were in fact coming right or, or, or leading to a certain awareness and, and clarity um, Mike, who I spoke about earlier, and that's his real name, by the way, Mike, uh, from the tire place, also didn't have an understanding of it, but by doing the mitzvah, he was automatically inviting this godly energy through the tools of this earth to rest within him. And that is the, the power of tefillin. It's a very precisely designed instrument, merging the heavenly energies of, of a higher intellect with the realities of this world and creating the unity that we need. To your second question, it's actually interesting that the smag, Rav Moshe of Kusi, in, in, in this particular uh, thing that he shares, um, uh, in regards to what he spoke to people, he was asked the same question. What if a person is not wholly righteous? People that he was dealing with, imagine 13th century, these were Jews who had obviously abandoned Jewish practice. And they came from knowledge. They didn't grow up fourth, fifth generation without the, without, with, without the instructions or the guidance or the education. They knew. They walked away from it at one level or another, one generation or two, removed from Jewish observance. So he, asked, he was asked the same question, and he answered it as follows. He said, if any Jew can approach the Torah, if any Jew is allowed to grasp the handle of a Torah and get an aliyah, and surely every single Jew is worthy of wearing the tefillin as well. If the Torah, which is at such a sublime holiness, can encompass every Jew, then surely the tefillin can as well. On a Hasidic level, if we bring it into our world and our understanding with Hasidus, tefillin is, is a connection to the deepest recesses of the essence of a Jew. That part of it is unsullied. That part is as pure as the day that God breathed it into our bodies. And that part of us is touched and awakened with this wonderful mitzvah of tefillin. Yeah, I'll pop in on the second point, which is that, you know, obviously not being religious, um, I do sin. And I, uh, you know, I'm not uh, fully kosher. I'm not, uh, I'm kosher at home, by the way, but I'm not fully kosher. So, you know. Where Mark, not yet. <laughs> well, be careful. Remember, I made a single deal so far with Rabbi Musinta. <laughs> but that's the point. I think that is the point, is that what I'm finding wearing tefillin is that the sins are lessening all the time. Because I guess this whole point about uh, binding heart to mind and uh, uh, taking action, before you know it, I'm actually, I just find that I am sinning a lot less. I am uh, being a bit more careful. And, um, and I think that... Uh, I think that it can continue. You know, when I, when, when I read the Amidah in the morning, now to fill it on, obviously there's the point where you um, need to apologize for your sins. So I always feel very good about that because I can strike my chest twice and apologize for the sins of the prior day. And then I feel like clear, clear and ready to go. But I've found, you know, in this COVID period where I've been zoned in on just being really good and really focused, as you say, you know, not distracted. I've been, uh, focused on uh, on on the speedometer was it the highway i couldn't remember that but um before you know it i'm striking my chest i'm saying actually what am i apologizing for they actually have been fewer and fewer sins so i think that's uh, uh, the the start of a great direction hopefully just uh, one more question which is a tough question that's coming up here there's a lady who's suffering with schizophrenia she says the Shema every day. Uh, isn't that unfair when she can't put in tefillin? So Rabbi Weinberg, I think we'll address that one to you. 
Okay, thank you, Masinta. That's uh, you know, that's it's it's very unfortunate and very hard to hear somebody struggling with it. It's a it's a terrible disease, and uh, to this woman and anybody else who is who is dealing with this challenge, Hashem should grant you a lot of blessing and healing and strength um, in in your challenge and in your in your in your endeavors because you will succeed and you will you will be able to lead a better life and and I, I pray that things do get easier for you on a day to day um basis tefillin is is one tool it's not the only tool it it? tefillin is not the only way that one creates a harmony in a life it is a guide the ingredients of tefillin can be adapted for those who do not need to wear tefillin so that they can too approach life in the way that tefillin instructs what else can somebody do if they are struggling there are, there, are, there are the two things um, that tefillin have that we need to do, are the three. One of them you're doing already. I think you said you're giving tzedakah, if I'm not mistaken. Um, there are three things. The first one is the mind, is to learn Torah. By spending a few minutes every day studying Torah, and the options today for studying Torah are vast. One engages their mind and brings in the godly mind into them as well and becomes completely enveloped with Hashem. The second is the heart. To Davin. We've heard of the most open heart today, Mark. I'm, I'm, I'm actually so moved by what you just shared. If I could talk about my sins and my forgiveness and talk to Hashem the way you do on a daily basis, I, I would be a much, I'd feel better about myself. You're inspiring. And this is prayer at its, its most rawest form. And that's the second level. We, when by Davin to Hashem and dedicating a few minutes to talk to Hashem. And finally, the action, the act of tzedakah. These three activities um, allow a person to harmonize life in a very deep way. They bring the mind, the heart, and action into their daily experience. I just uh, also want to point out that um, we're all God's children, Jewish people, non-Jewish people, and every single human being can have a very special, unique relationship with God. Nobody's better than anybody else. We all create it slightly differently. But every human being can have a very unique relationship with God and get their mind to control their heart. Um, Rabbi Weinberg, you have a tefillin fund that if somebody can't afford a pair of tefillin and they commit to put on every day, you have the Ichikovitz International Tefillin Fund and apparently you sponsor tefillin for everybody. Is that correct? Well, I don't, but the, the, the tefillin bank does and it's a tremendous uh, endeavor that, that we have been able to, thank God, expand glo to globally as well, internationally. Um, the Chikovitz Family International Tefillin Bank is committed to helping anybody who would like to commit daily to the mitzvah, but finds the cost of tefillin, which can be quite prohibitive or expensive, uh, it's handmade in every facet and so on, so the um, cost can be high, and somebody who finds that cost beyond their means, the tefillin bank will help. Um, all they really need to do is make a daily commitment, just like Mark made a daily commitment, and, and make that daily commitment, uh, put in a reference of their rabbi. Um, we've literally got a drop down menu of every rabbi in South Africa. And they will be given a pair of tefillin basically for free. It's a $50 uh, membership fee, as we call it. And this is a tribute to the Chikovitz family who experienced tefillin as uh, Ruby, their son, um, one of the sons of the family, uh, was, was learning for bar mitzvah and the family got involved in tefillin and got excited by it and wanted to give that opportunity to anybody who need, wants it, but can't afford it. So they make that, that, that available. And we've now gone to about 14 or 15 countries and we're expanding globally as well to make that available to more people. And, and the stories are incredible. The stories and the feedback and the testimonials are beyond moving of how it affects and changes people's lives. I wanna tell you, um, Mark, just following on what you said, this story of Mike, which I mentioned, which by the way, you can find in Chabad.org. If you Google Yossi Bell's tefillin or Rabbi Goldman uh, tires, you'll find the story. And, and, and there, they, they revisited him because the story only came out a few years ago and Rabbi Goldman and one of these boys were chatting and he shared this letter. And they went back to visit Mike. Today, Mike doesn't only put on a tefillin every day. He's actually graduated to the point where he closes his tire shop on Shabbos. Big sign outside that says closed on Saturdays, open Sundays. Now, who closes their tire shop on Shabbos, right? Saturdays is a very busy trading day. He closes his shop now because he has developed exactly what you said, Mark, the faith 
that Hashem will manage and take care of things. And he has started actually his shop, his shop is now Shabbos compliant as well. And that's the beauty of it. It leads from one mitzvah to another mitzvah, to a deeper awareness, to a deeper sense of calm and faith. And it really is a beautiful gateway to so many opportunities. And I just want to add to what Rabbi Masinta said. You know, this whole lockdown has taught us that so many of the practices that we are used to are not necessary in the sense that if God doesn't want us to do them, we can reach him without them. I'm used to davening with a minion every day. Who doesn't hear the tar reading on Shabbos? Davening with a minion and hearing a kedusha. People going through a yard site and can't say Kaddish. All of these things are realities today. And we've learned that if God says you don't need it because there's a higher priority, which is your health and your life, therefore you don't need this. Now you cannot do this. It means you can reach God in a way without that. That is essentially what God is saying. And that's true that we had the question about women who cannot put on tefillin. Um, days where nobody puts on tefillin, Shabbos and Yom Tif, or Gentiles who have no mitzvah of tefillin whatsoever. Regardless, it doesn't mean that they don't have the ability to connect. It's God is simply saying, you don't need this tool with which to connect. You don't need this tool with which to find the harmony. There is another way to be done, and it's your way. And each one of us needs to find that way in order to connect with Hashem and find the harmony and the in unity in our life. Um, that was outstanding, both of you. Very insightful, very inspiring. Um, I'm gonna, we're going to end off with as follows. I'm going to ask Aram just to show the video, to show a, a video, a very short video, I think it's a minute and a half of how Twilin are made, and which will be followed by closing remarks from Aram. But I want to thank you both for what you, you've given here tonight. And please God, through more and more good people putting in Twilin, may we have the revelation of Mashiach immediately. Amen. I'm not hearing any sound. And all the panelists mute themselves. It has, as you can see over here, four compartments. Now, each, the tefillin is made from hide of a kosher animal. It's meant to be made from one piece of hide, the upper part, the bottom part, and the separations. Since it's very hard to make, it takes a long time, it becomes too expensive, and it's such an important mitzvah. So they came up to, to an idea to make it from pieces glued together. As you can see over here, it's coming apart. This is made from pieces glued together. The top and the bottom are coming apart. This is called the Nebo Pshutim. This is simple. The lowest level that you can get of filling. According to some opinions, they say, we look at it now, that's one piece that passes. Other opinions say, no, the fact that you glue, glue it together does not make it one. The next one is made also from pieces glued together, but only, but only from two pieces. As you can see, this is Cut, cuts and folds all over, but it's made from one piece. It gets folded up and it becomes four compartments and it turns in to that and to that. And then it goes into a base and it becomes a pair of film. This is called in Hebrew Pshutim Mehudarim. It's still simple, but it's a higher level of, sim higher level of simple because the section that keeps the scrolls inside is already made from the same piece. The next one is made completely from one piece. As you can see, that's how it starts. It took a piece of raw hide of a kosher animal they put it in a mold. That's what it looks like, stage one. Stage two, it's already getting squeezed together. There are the four compartments. Stage three, it's beginning to look like filling slowly. Stage four, this is already got the sheen. It's pinched out from the eye. It's not made, it's not added. Everything is made from the same piece, as you can see, the four compartments. And once this is done, it looks just like that. We put in the skulls. We saw there's 12 holes representing the 12 tribes of Israel, and we saw it together with this, which is made from veins of a kosher animal. Close.
Aaron? Ladies and gentlemen, showing a video on Zoom is very, very challenging. Can I just say one more thing, um, sure. if I may, just before we close? Sure. Uh, following on from what Rabbi Weinberg was addressing in terms of um, someone who suffers from schizophrenia and battling to connect, I've just got to say that I think in this COVID period, the ones who have reserves need to utilize their reserves. This is not a time for hoarding. You know, in the eye of the storm of the hotel business going um, potentially under, you know, this is a time where my inclination was to save. That was my initial inclination, hoard my reserves. But that faith in Hashem, that Imunah, made me do the opposite. Maybe it's because of the davening and tefillin, made me do the opposite and made me start giving and giving and giving. I mean, be it the beggars on the street now, it's unbelievable. I mean, they would have had the cars driving past, giving them a rand, a rand, a rand, and then all of a sudden there's no cars. How do they catch up? And just that act of giving and giving more than ever, giving reserves, I think has really, really been very, very powerful for me. And I think that's been a major connection um, uh, for God. So I think that some who are trying to connect and battling, just think about, you know, really doubling down and giving in this incredibly tough time of COVID and giving um, uh, openly. And I think that uh, with the faith in Hashem, you're going to be fine and all others who benefit from you now are going to really, really re be grateful. That's it. Sorry, just a little thing I had to say. Aaron, we don't hear you. Is my sound coming through? Now it is. So um, in the current situation that the world finds itself in, Rabbi Weinberg and Mark, thank you so much because your messages are most appropriate and important for everyone to hear. Um, they, they certainly took, to my heart, I, I certainly learned a lot and I certainly took a lot of the the mitzvahs that I take from time to time for granted, um, they have now put a new perspective to them. So thank you. Um, they were certainly, they certainly need timeless. So thank you very much for that. Um, regarding, uh, regarding just to make mention again that the Tefillin Bank for all those that want to get involved, want to, want to know more about it, please be in touch with us. We will put you in touch with Rabbi Weinberg regarding the Tefillin Bank. And on behalf of Chabad House and everyone watching, thank you both. And for all those that joined in, thank you. And we hope you enjoyed. Have a great evening. Thank you.